Good evening. I'll call the meeting of the Hudson Board of Education, regular meeting Tuesday, December 8th, 2009. Thanks for coming. Uh, we'll begin the meeting with the Pledge of Allegiance. If we please stand. Board members have a copy of the agenda in front of them. And if I if I can entertain a motion for approval of the agenda. So Mr. Pre Mr. President, I'd just like to um, make one change. 4A, we're waiting for an interpreter to uh, come. And because of the weather, we're not positive if that person will get here. Okay. But we'd like the flexibility to do that at some time during the agenda okay. later Very on. Good. Thanks, Mary. So moved. Second. Right. Motion by Lynn, a second by Cindy. Any discussion? If not, all those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, motions approved. We'll move on to the superintendent's report. Mary, with noting that uh, change to the agenda, we'll move on to the spring 2010 <coughs> Board of Education election. Yes, certainly we have an election coming up in April, as we do each year, April 6th. And um, the term for the two positions on the board uh, runs from April 26, 2010 to April 22nd, uh, 2013. So it's a three-year term. Our incumbents are Cindy Crimmins and Mark Kaiserschott. And um, papers need to be in our office, the district administrative office, the superintendent's office, by 5 o'clock on Tuesday, January 5th. Um, if we would have to have a primary, it would be on uh, February 6th, regular primary election date. Mary, question on, on that point. Um, if anyone in the public is interested, are these papers available online for them to? I don't believe they are yet, but we plan to put them up. They are now? They are. OK. So they are Thank available you. online by going to the district's website? Correct. Okay. Thank you. We'll move on to uh, reports. School district property tax reduced by tax credits. Tim? Okay. Uh, we, uh, first time we've ever really tried to represent what um, our gross taxes that, that's reported when the district passes a budget and what the mill rate is and that's really reported at gross and then looking at what we wanted to try to try to do here is look at the different credits um, that are introduced and how that affects uh, where we are when we report the mill rate to after the person gets their property tax bill and what they see on their bill um, and so this really relate this relates to the school portion of property tax and uh, up on the screen um, you can see we've got we have an actual bill and this bill is from 2008 the 2009 bills are not available yet but this is so we're talking about 2008 figures and I just want to run through quickly uh, some of the numbers that we're going to be looking at when we go on to the next piece of this report uh, this particular particular property is assessed at $191,600 and again this is a 2008 bill and if you look at the school portion of the property tax uh, over in the far right column where it says 2008 net tax, it's $1,108.97. Now, another component of the uh, property tax are the first dollar credits. Those came in, uh, I believe 2008 was the first year for the, for the first dollar levy credit, and that's an educational related credit. Uh, the second credit that you see down on the lower left-hand corner that's circled uh, for $222.55 is the school levy tax credit. And uh, that, that particular credit is uh, taken off the top of the, the number 1,108 under, under the net tax. Now, if you go to the next uh, page, Okay, now what we've done here is we've taken, taken four different properties, and uh, the property number three is the previous sample that we looked at. And I just want to walk you through the, this process. Um, 
and how we get to an estimated uh, net impact um, on, a, on a particular, on a, on a home. And so I'm not gonna go through each one of those property examples, but if you look at the bolded one, property number three, again, we've got the assessed value. Uh, the school tax before credits, that's uh, so really gross school tax. So that's, we, we derive that by taking the net school tax and adding the school levy tax. Uh, so we get a gross tax of 1,332. Uh, going down the list under the school related credits, then we've got the school levy tax credit, and that's $223. And then we've got the new first dollar credit, and that's $27 for 2008. Now 2009, that credit will be doubling to $54. Uh, but in, is, in this example, under 2008, we've got $27. So taking those credits off of the, of the tax before all credits and then subtracting the credits, we get down to uh, net, school tax, uh, net school tax after all of the related credits uh, brings it down to $1,082. That's about 81% of, of the total gross tax before we started. Uh, if you look across that line under net school tax, uh, you can see it runs anywhere from 80% in, in the one example under property one, about 78% in property number two, 81% in number three, and then almost 80% uh, in property number four. So taking that data and then going down to calculating what an estimated, and I'm gonna say again, estimated, tax would be on a $200,000 home in the district uh, for 2009. Uh, we'll start with a district mill rate, and that increase uh, went, we went from 704 to $7.67, so a $0.63 cent increase. And so the estimated gross increase on a $200,000 home is $126. Uh, when we do an estimated credits based on that information, based on the information from the above uh, sample homes, uh, we use an average of about 20%, so about a 20% credit. So that's about $25, and that reduces that $126 increase down to down $25. So we get an estimated net school tax increase on the $200,000 home of about $101. Um, and again, this doesn't this doesn't include the increase in the new credit, which is a first dollar credit, and that's again that's actually going to be doubling. So uh, that's a flat credit, no matter what your property value is, that credit is the same for everyone. And so for two, in 2008, that was $27, and in 2009, it will be uh, $54. So that's just to give, give folks an idea of what, you know, after the levy's passed, and we talk about the mill rate, and we're talking gross, uh, gross impact, and this is to give an idea of what it may look like as a net impact after all the credits are taken into account. So, any questions? Any questions for Tim? <clears throat> Mr. President, just a comment. Um, the way the tax bills are written and the way this has been handled by the legislature becomes very um, confusing, I, I believe, to our community to really realize that there are additional dollars that support um, school uh, education in Hudson. And um, they, they don't come in the form of state aids. We have state aids, but there are additional credits that come on the property tax bill that are designated uh, to reduce school costs to each of our property tax owners. And I think that's the really important uh, message that we want to make sure that we get out, that there are additional credits that appear on the, uh, their tax bills that are often dis difficult to really recognize as that. Okay. Let's move on to the three-year financial forecast. Tim. Okay. Uh, again, another really first uh, for the district in putting together a, a multiple year forecast looking forward, um, really a, a useful planning tool uh, long term. And I just want to note a couple of things uh, before we get into the meat of the of the data. And uh, that's the the paragraph underneath the cover pages, you know, these are, we have various assumptions built into this forecast. 
really summary data, that data will change uh, as we go through, as we go along. Um, we'll continue to update that. But this, is, this represents, some of the numbers that you're going to see tonight represent portions of the budget. It's not the full budget, but in total we, we have uh, the summary dollars there. Um, so anything that has a material impact that we know about at this time is reflected on, on the budget. And that's, uh, as you see when we go into the assumptions, uh, you'll see the major impacts. So uh, with that, we'll move into the, into the first page. The uh, first page lays out 2010, 11, 11, 12, and 12, 13 fiscal years. And uh, again, you know, there's a, there, there are a lot of things that can affect this forecast, things that, such as le legislative actions at the federal and state level, uh, depending on funding, you know, changes to funding, et cetera, uh, certainly economic conditions. Uh, there's all sorts of different things that can affect this forecast. So one thing, uh, when we do look at this, we, one thing we do know is the numbers are going to change as we go forward with this forecast. And so as things become material uh, that we think are going to affect the budget, uh, we will update. So the first section is under revenue. So the major, some major components uh, that we're projecting that will have, a, have an impact, positive or negative, on revenue uh, are listed out here. And we really have three items. And uh, wh one of the areas is special education categorical funding, and that's state aid that we get uh, for special education. And uh, we're expecting that to go down about $273,000 for 10-11. And the reason that's going to go down is uh, it's due to the stimulus dollars that we received. And because we have a shift in funding, uh, the stimulus dollars are federal, and the categorical funding dollars are state. We've actually shifted some costs over to federal, uh, so we have less cost to claim on state, and that's just a consequence of using those stimulus funds. Uh, we want to use those funds because we have a timeline to use them, and so it wouldn't be prudent to do anything different, but this is just uh, an effect of using those stimulus dollars. Uh, the next uh, piece that we won't have in 2010-11 is the, is the stimulus funding itself. If we look at stimulus funding along with some carryover in, uh, in grants, and some Medicaid reimbursements. We're expecting about a $1.3 million drop uh, in revenue there. And, and again, um, I want to I want to remind folks that general fund and special ed fund are really tied together. They're separate funds, but they're really tied together um, for our purposes here. Um, but so we look at that that first year is year that we'll lose. Uh, we expect to lose some of those aids. Uh, if we go down to the increase in state aid, uh, that looks pretty rosy, but this is actually a pretty conservative estimate uh, of what we expect state aids to do. And one of the things that, uh, if you remember, going back to this current year, we lost 10.4% of our state aid, and that was due to changes in the formula that the state legislature put in so that they could help their help the state budget. And uh, so we're expecting in this example, when we go into the aid formula, it's kind of a complicated formula, go into that formula and uh, estimate actually zeros. So really the only thing driving this number uh, is some pretty modest student growth about between 1.2 and 1.3% for the next three years out. Um, so making those changes and assuming that we don't have any uh, reduction or cutback in state aid for 10-11, uh, we are going to, we would realize a sizable increase in aid. So again, that doesn't look conservative when you look at the percentage, but remem remembering what's happened this year with the cutback and then getting back to a normal state aid formula, actually a very conservative state aid formula, uh, we're looking at about a $2.4 million increase. And then again, 11, 12, and 12, 13 are really uh, driven by the, uh, the, by the student growth. Uh, we do have a small note that uh, in uh, 9 10, we've used fund balance or, or planning to use fund balance of a million fifty. In these examples on this first page, we're not, we're not assuming uh, any use of fund balance. Uh, if we look at items that affect expenditures, under total expenditure increases for 2010 11, uh, we're looking at 3.8 million, and that's about a 7.9% increase. Again, uh, as I mentioned, we lose, when we lose stimulus dollars, 
um, we again have a direct, it has a direct effect on the general fund and direct effect on our overall expenditures. So um, with that loss, uh, that drives up uh, what the general fund covers for special education. And uh, we, can't, we really go back up to a normal level of uh, the amount that we've normally covered special education by. So uh, that's why that, re that number of 7.92 is reflected there. It's really uh, a loss of the, the two top numbers at the top uh, under revenue, uh, 273 and a million, 1.3 million. So really covering those revenues. If we didn't have that situation happening and we looked at our percentage increase in expenditures, it would be at 4.69%. Uh, so again, uh, and that's assuming that we've got student growth, uh, et cetera. So uh, again, then we go to 11-12, and total expenditures are going up 4.46%, uh, and 12-13 going up 4.59%. And uh, the amount and under the second section, amount included uh, in the above expenditures for the following, we've planned in uh, for the first year, we've planted only student growth, so keeping really keeping the budget um, as lean as we can. Uh, in the second year, is some program development, uh, HSD 2025, continuing in implementation, and some capital project uh, additions there. Uh, so you see the the, uh, the the what's how that's broken apart. Those bot the, that second row of numbers is included in the first row though. So we're just breaking these out to show you what the kind of the additional new dollars put into the budget are. Um, if we get down to this, the second section, there's a, a summary of revenue expenditure and fund balance. And uh, we've presented the 9-10 budget along for, compar for comparison purposes. And uh, you can see the forecast numbers for 10-11, 11-12, and 12-13. Uh, so when you get down to the surplus deficit line, you'll see in the in the 910 budget again. As I mentioned, we're planning a million fifty thousand of fund balance use, and then the three years out from that are balanced budgets with revenues and expenditures being equal. Um, if you look at fund balance as a percentage of our expenditures, and again we use fund balance um, to prevent uh, short-term borrowing, prevent uh, incurring those costs, uh, gives us some flexibility. Uh, because we don't receive our revenues in a rateable fashion. So uh, we have a fund balance projected uh, in 10-11 of 30, about 30% of the expenditures. And then uh, that's maintained. Uh, and so as expenditures go up and you maintain the fund balance, the percentage, of course, starts to go down. But 28% in 11-12 and 27.5% in 12-13. Um, if, if we look at uh, what we project as estimates for the levy amount that we would under levy. Uh, in 10-11, we'd under levy by about 5.8 million. In 11-12, we'd under levy by about 6.5 million. And in 12-13, 6.4 million dollars. Okay, moving on to the uh, second page. Here we've put together three different scenarios to take a look at what um, percentage-wise, what things would look like if we were to use uh, fund balance. So we dip into the fund balance. And again, um, use of fund balance is not something sustainable. It's usually something you can do uh, really on a one-time basis. Um, whoops, I'm sorry. I'm going to... I'm going to go back to the assumptions at the top. There are property value growth, levy, and mill rates. Uh, the assumption for property growth is in 10-11, we'd have a 0% growth. Now, comparing that to 9-10, we went down about 2.5%. In 11-12, we're assuming a 0% increase. And then in 12-13, we're assuming a pretty modest increase of 1%. So 0%, 0%, 1% 1% at this point for our estimate for property valuation growth. Uh, the uh, What that what that looks like then when we put all those numbers together and make all of those assumptions and get down to uh, what the total levy would be for general fund and debt service uh, you can see the numbers going across and uh, so it represents about an 8.85 percent increase in 10 11 uh, and then a four and a half percent increase in 11 12 and four and a half and 12 13. 
Uh, mill rate would go uh, to $8.35 per 1,000, which is an 8.85% increase again. And then 4.5% uh, in 11.12, and then 12.13, it would uh, go up 3.47%. And 1213, it's 3.47. Uh, the difference is due to the property valuations going up by 1%. Uh, so that's why that number is different. Uh, doesn't isn't the same as uh, the levy increase. So okay, now we now we get on to the fund balance use scenarios. Uh, we we laid out a couple three different scenarios, and this is using fund balance just in 2010 2011 only. So just for that one year, uh, what would happen if we use fund balance of 500,000, uh, 750, and then a million dollars in the third example? And uh, I think maybe rather than reading through all of this. Um, and I'll just let you look at it. Uh, you can see the corresponding decreases. Of course, as we use more fund balance in that first year, uh, then 11, 12 in terms of percentage, it goes, the percentage goes up more. So as we use more fund balance in the first year, the impact is on the second year as a percentage wise, it goes, we go up a little bit more. So uh, any questions? I know that's a lot to uh, take in. Mr. President. Um, Tim, I was wondering if you can talk a little bit about property valuations. I know we use 0% in our model. Um, what are we seeing for property values in, our, in the St. Croix Valley area, in our county? Well, we've, well, of course, this last year we had property values went down 2.5% overall for the district. Okay. Uh, Mr. President, how does that compare, Tim, to the rest of the state? Uh, St. Croix County was... Um, one of the either second or third in the percentage drop in value statewide. Uh, we had, uh, I believe it was uh, either Pierce or Polk and then uh, St. Croix County. So those were the top three counties that lost the most value percentage on a percentage basis in the statewide. So uh, we've, been, we've been hit pretty hard with that decrease. Any other questions for Tim? Okay. Mr. President, I just want to reinforce, and I know Tim would um, appreciate this, that when we come out with this forecast, uh, the numbers are um, certainly not locked in stone in any way, shape, or form. As everyone knows around this table, um, even the, the next year, 2010-11, there are assumptions within those numbers. The information that we need to uh, lock those numbers in is not available to us. It's based on assumptions. And as we get further away from the next year, those numbers even get softer. But it does help us um, when we're looking ahead to see what happens when we use fund balance, when we can project into the future. I just want to point out that in 2000. 11, 12, and Tim, correct me if I'm wrong, that's the next biennium budget. Yes. And um, the situation could change very drastically depending upon what happens in Madison. So just knowing that this is, we're basing this on the best information we have at the present time. It's really a point in time that we have this information. And I know Tim plans to update this as we move forward and receive more information and uh, anything that would help us um, be closer to um, our final numbers. Great. Thank you. Good point. Mary, just um, as a point of information, I happened to pull an article off the web that relates to this discussion, and um, this came out of the Wisconsin Journal Sentinel in November, and I think everybody's heard this, is that Wisconsin, this is a Pew Center study on states, and um, Wisconsin made the cut in the worst uh, in the worst uh, budgets of all the states they're in the 10 worst budgets yep. with um, Wisconsin ranked ninth um, just above California that's right and yes. we know we've heard a lot about California and their use of IOUs to pay debts and so I, I bring this up just as we look forward 
you know, with the budget forecasting, I think it's safe to say that we probably can't expect too much coming from Madison in terms of, you know, additional funding. Well, that's that very true. Safe. Yeah, it'll it'll be very dependent on what happens with the economy and and structurally uh, budgets. And I know that yes, the the Pew study that you're talking about, yeah. uh, and the numbers uh, are don't look real promising. Uh, they they indicate that. The 2011 to 13th budget will start with a structural deficit of two billion dollars. So that's that's the challenge. Absolutely. And you know, from the state's perspective, you know, that's going to push a lot of the burden onto the local, as well as the school districts, to try to raise the revenues needed to, you know, fund education. Anyway, um, anything else on that topic? Okay. Uh, topics for action. Uh, 2010 11 budget development and resource reallocation process. Mary? As you know, for the current year budget, we reduced, uh, had a process to reduce that budget by 2.3 million dollars. Over the last few years, we have realigned our resources. Um, we have used resources to reduce the cost of new positions in the district. We have um, looked at when we added a course at the high school, taking courses away from the high school. And so we've been, for a number of years, looking at realigning our resources and using um, existing resources when we can uh, to reduce new costs. Uh, when we looked forward um, to the next budget year, at last month, uh, the board approved a process which I recommended um, reducing uh, that budget year um, budget by a very significant amount. That process was designed to reduce the budget by a significant amount in 2010-11. Uh, and um, following that, we held a work session on November 30th to talk about the ramifications of that um, process and what that would mean for the district um, and for our initiatives and to share some additional information. And one of the things that uh, Tim shared was the three-year budget forecast, a preliminary look at that um, at that time. And uh, that was based on some new information we had received from the state as well about the budget and um, had been updated um, when we were looking forward. With that information, we also shared with the board that um, because we have been realigning resources and using resources to cut additional or to reduce additional costs, um, we have really pulled the budget in. We, we, um, uh, opened up Rivercrest, for example, uh, without an increase in our mill rate. And um, that's a significant increase in our operating costs when we take a new uh, school this size, particularly online. So we've been continuing to do things like that, and um, it really takes away uh, flexibility in our budget. With that in mind, and looking to the next year, and looking at um, considering a potential large reduction again, as we did for this coming budget, um, we needed to talk about what that would mean. It really would be down to a significant number of staff positions, because there are not a lot of other areas for us to reduce when 75% um, of our budget approximately is in staff um, costs. So looking at that and also considering the initiatives and the, um, our work in the district and the board's um, commitment to moving HSD 2025 forward and raising our expectations for student learning, um, that would have a significant, very, very significant negative impact on uh, those efforts. In fact, um, bringing them basically to a halt, at least temporarily for the present time. Uh, with that in mind, certainly the, the board expressed and the administration as well reluctance to go that direction. Um, and as a result of that, the board particularly reaffirmed their commitment to HSD 2025, the vision and the plan, and to continuing um, raising our expectations for student learning across the district and um, using the budget, planning the budget around that. And with that um, work at the board, 
a work session, uh, I give you the following administrative recommendation, which really continues that commitment. First of all, to develop a budget um, for 2010-11 as identified in the three-year financial forecast that uh, Tim just talked about. This would also modify the 2010-11 budget reduction process that was previously approved in November and change that to a 2010-11 budget development and resource reallocation process. Um, when I talk about resource reallocation, that would include program operations and staff. And then base visibly conservative budget development and resource reallocation uh, decisions on the following priorities. Um, implementing HSD 2025 as we've planned. Continuing efforts to improve the system for higher uh, student achievement. Maintaining class size guidelines where applicable and possible and the reason those words are there if we just look at the middle school and some of our courses because of um, our space limitations for learning, uh, we're not always able to um, make all of those our guidelines, um, they are guidelines I guess would be the best way to say that. Uh, to realign staff and resources through reallocation, reorganization and or reduction based on priorities and needs to provide operations to support high quality and continuous improvement efforts, to add staff for enrollment growth or HSD 2025 implementation only when reallocation of resources and staff position realignment is insufficient, and to use staff attrition where possible when positions are reduced or eliminated. Um, and that certainly would lessen the impact on our current staff. And then D, to determine, as, as Tim talked about, fund balance and various scenarios for that, any use of the fund balance prior to the annual meeting um, and that uh, proposed budget is uh, acted on, upon by our electors um, after more information is known. So that's really the crux of the recommendation and what follows on the next pages that you have is the development process um, and resource reallocation process that I propose um, administrative uh, and our administrative team does as well. And it uses many of the components of the last process, um, but this becomes a more internal process for us to really look at realignment of our resources to the vision and to the work that we've been doing that really values the work of our teachers and our administrators to um, improve learning for each and every student. Uh, throughout our, our system. So it starts with a three-year financial forecast that Tim just introduced to you, and then it follows with um, changing the, the um, direction to a reallocation, resource reallocation process this evening and uh, for your consideration. Number three, it was established priorities, which are listed on the page that I just um, read. Uh, for decision-making, that would be C on the previous page. and. Um, by uh, uh, proving this process, you would put those priorities into place for decision making. Number four would be something that we have um, already initiated. This is a process that we have done in the past few years, um, and we are doing it very, um, uh, I don't, uh, assertively is probably the best word instead of aggressively this year looking at um, our staff program and operations based on the priorities that we just talked about and looking for where we can realign those um, resources to those priorities where we can reorganize, where we can um, use them to reduce, again, the new costs that we might have in uh, the next year's budget. So uh, the personnel committee would do a preliminary review of that work on January 6th as one of the first steps. Um, it's administrative work at the present time. Five, we would um, develop certainly an administrative recommendation to bring to you. It would go to finance for, again, a preliminary review in February and then personnel committee uh, preliminarily as well. We would um, then present our preliminary administrative recommendation to you on February 9th at the February 9th board meeting. Um, of course, if there were any administrators or, or individual staff members, could be administrators, could be um, teachers, support staff, uh, on uh, this preliminary, a preliminary reduction list, then we would want to meet with them ahead and let them know that um, prior to that 
board session when it becomes public. Seven, the board would um, be scheduled to take action in, at their March 9th meeting, and um, we would uh, take any information or questions that you have and prepare that uh, prior to that meeting, and then meeting with any of the individual staff members after following, right after that meeting, uh, who are affected by your actions, um, which includes a potential possible uh, staff layoffs list. And then um, human resources would then um, distribute the layoff notices if to any, any staff members. That would follow with um, generally our process that we've used in the past, certainly looking at um, enrollment growth throughout the summer and monitoring and tracking that and then bringing um, any additional considerations that we need to look at uh, back to the personnel committee and then finally to the board. So we'd be monitoring that all the way through the beginning of school. And then nine would be preparing the proposed budget as Tim and his uh, department have done um, April through August, probably even a longer period than that. And then certifying the budget and levy uh, prior to November 1st. If you have any questions, I'd be happy to try to answer those. Any questions for Mary? Okay. Uh, this would take board action to um, actually replace the process that you had um, previously approved with this process that uh, the administration recommends to you. Okay, thank you. Um, if there's no questions regarding this revised process, I'll entertain a motion for approval. Move to approve. Motion by Cindy. Second. Second by Barb. Any discussion? If not, all those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, motion's approved. Thanks, Mary. We'll move on to uh, topics for action B. Uh, excuse me, I, I put in a request to speak on that last item. Okay, I'm sorry. Uh, Bob, why don't you come forward and state your name and address, please. Uh, uh, Robert McClensky, 1301 Freer Street in Hudson. I just Thank had a question. I know at the uh, last board meeting there was a long discussion about, I thought it was tied to this, and, and there was an article in the newspaper about a um, community engagement process to through focus groups to get input on these types of things. And I just read through that, and I didn't see that on there. Is that a separate thing, or is that part of this, or... What happened to that? Mary? Um, Bob, yes, in the last process, when we were looking at a very significant reduction mm -hmm. to that was going to be primarily staff positions, we certainly wanted to go out to our community and get the priorities that our community wanted and um, set up that criteria in that manner. We've changed that process to a realignment reallocation process to the um, direction that the board has already set. That's really an internal administrative process um, instead of a whole uh, community-wide process of setting that criteria. Okay, so, so that discussion, what Tracy described last month, that's not gonna happen, is what you're saying. The process that was approved by the board last month is not going to okay, go forward. Okay, I didn't realize that this had been approved. This replaces that. Oh, okay, that was part of that process. I thought it was just a okay. report of something that was being suggested, but that was actually approved last? That was approved last month, but um, <clears throat> what the board and the administration mm -hmm. uh, really um, supported the work of our staff right. and said that, no, we do not want to make that level of, of uh, reduction um, because of the progress that we're making, um, valuing the work of our staff, and okay. changing it to a reallocation aligned with the, um, the priorities of the board. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thanks, Bob. Okay, we'll move on to uh, topics for action 6B, appointment of deputy clerk for spring election. Mary? I recommend to the board that, as we've done in the past, that our Director of Financial Services, Tim Erickson, serve as the Deputy Clerk with assistance from um, my Executive Assistant, Diane Radel. So okay. moved. Motion by Cindy. Second. Second by Mark. Any discussion? 
All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, motion's approved. Next item, uh, the 2010 11 course proposals. I believe Sandy's going to handle that. Thank you. Tonight, Learning Services brings before you three new course proposals for the 2010 11 school year. Uh, two of them are continuations of programs that we began this year. The first one, Principles of Engineering. You may recall that we started Project Lead the Way this school year with Introduction of Engineering. And this is the second course in the sequence. And so starting next year, we would offer then Principles of Engineering, which continues those kind of same concepts, laboratory-based, very hands-on. Students looking then at how engineers really work using the skills of math and science and technology, and really getting involved in some engineering type problem solving. Uh, the prerequisite for this course would be the first course, Introduction to Engineering, and we are looking at having two teachers uh, trained in this course, and then actually having one additional teacher trained in Intro to Engineering, so we'd have two tech ed teachers trained in both courses as we move forward. Um, that requires some uh, additional pieces. They need a pretty powerful laptop to, uh, to deal with the software that they need for the course. There is an annual software fee and then some additional supplies. Recall, though, that we did receive a, found, a grant from the Kern Foundation, who promotes Project Lead the Way, an Anderson Foundation grant to help support Project Lead the Way, and then we also have some Carl Perkins funds that we can use. The majority, I mean, the majority of these costs are covered through the grant. The second course then is Mandarin Chinese. We began Chinese this school year. We have exploratory at the seventh grade level and Mandarin Chinese level one at the high school level. This then would let us expand so that eighth graders could begin with level one and our high school students then can progress to level two. Again, at a minimum, we're looking at a half time FTE, Mandarin Chinese teacher, some curriculum writing time, and then again, some textbooks and resources. And then our third course actually is coming out. Are those good? Can I combine that with the next one? With renewable energy, uh, TechEd is really looking at making some gains in our priorities with environmental sustainability, and this comes out of the TechEd area. Uh, Mr. Klatt has proposed a renewable energy course, which is pretty exciting. You can see they'd be looking at solar thermal, photovoltaic, biodiesel processing, wind power, and recycling. And he's quite excited. He's working quite closely right now with Stevens Point, who does quite a bit with energy uh, curriculum, and we're trying to nail that down over the next few months. The curriculum writing for both Mandarin Chinese and Renewable Energy would come out of the Learning Services budget as we do our budget planning process, as well as some of those initial, initial supply uh, costs. And then, of course, it rolls into uh, the high school budget. Uh, I have been working with Principal Lucas and the Tech Ed Department, recognizing that our priorities do look at then reallocation, reorganization, or reduction within the Tech Ed Department because they are adding new courses. We will be taking out of the course handbook both engineering drafting and construction trades so that the overall effect of this would be um, no new staffing needed. We'd be reallocating in order to make the two tech ed courses work, and then Nancy Sweet and Ed Lucas and I are also working and are quite confident we can also, through the reallocation and reorganization, also <coughs> add the Mandarin Chinese with no additional staffing costs. Questions? Any questions for Didn't quite hit it. <laughs> You did cover all those things, <laughs> except for one thing, um, I think, and, and maybe you said this, Sandy, uh, Mandarin Chinese uh, trying to secure a .5 half-time teacher may be extremely difficult, and it may be that we need to add a full-time teacher to move that course forward. That may be a commitment we could make. We probably could get a Mandarin teacher um, at a half time as long as they didn't have to be certified in the state of Wisconsin, which uh, we know has to occur and that um, has some limitations for us as a result. So it may have to be increased to a full-time position. I just want you to know that up front. Mm -hmm. Okay, any questions for Sandy or Mary? Question. Sandy. If you have to hire a full-time teacher in order to get the Mandarin Chinese the certified Mandarin Chinese instruction, um, the other half of that person's time, how will that be spent? 
when we were actually looking for this year and not sure how many sections we would have, uh, we were proposing that that teacher would do some, um, perhaps some Mandarin Chinese, these are options, Mandarin Chinese perhaps for elementary before or after school. They would work with the Euro-Asian courses in both the literature and social studies that we would find other connections that would um, use their time and, and, uh, in, in ways that would also move us forward. Sandy, can you talk a little bit about just how well received Mandarin Chinese has been within the school district? I mean, has it really taken hold? Students strong interest. We were very pleased. We have three sections of Mandarin Chinese one at the high school. Obviously, um, numbers have kind of massage themselves over that first quarter, as students find out a little bit about it. But I think um, the teacher, Andrea Traverse, also talks about the middle school level and just how excited those middle school students are and that they truly are showing that they don't find Mandarin Chinese difficult. I mean, that was one of the concerns. Now, why are we starting Mandarin Chinese? It's such a difficult language. Students don't know that it's difficult. And pro that's probably some of the, uh, you know, the teachers, side as far as being an outstanding teacher, but also just that students don't think of things difficult like that, and they're just really uh, doing a great job of um, catching on right away and making that happen. But we're very pleased with our first trimester under our belt as far as what the students are doing at both the middle level and high school. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? I'll entertain a motion for approval of the these courses. So moved. Motion by Mark. Second. Second by Tom. Any discussion? If not, all those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, motion's approved. Thanks, Sandy. Thank you. We'll move on to education for employment plan. Back to Sandy. Yes. I have the executive summary, and it is, of course, the Education Forward Employment Plan is a little thicker than the document we have to send to the state. But once again, we are required by the state of Wisconsin to complete an Education Forward Employment Plan and submit it uh, one every five years. And the plan, which must be approved by the school board, is intended to be a tool to help us develop learning opportunities that prepare all students for future employment. Uh, Melissa Hansen is with me this evening, and we'll have Melissa come on up. Melissa is our school to career coordinator, and she is going to be with us this evening to highlight, yeah, come on up here, to highlight the plan. She led the team which developed our 2009-2014 plan, and I believe you'll see through Melissa's um, overview some highlights that will really show connections to our current initiatives throughout the district. This plan was reviewed by the Learning and Program Development Committee on November 19th. And the costs of this plan, when you see some of the goals here, will also become a part of our district budgeting process. And as you'll see, many are connected with HSD 2025 ASCA plan, which the counselors are working on and other initiatives. So it's kind of all melding together when we look at, those, again, those overall costs for implementation. So Melissa, thank you. Hi, Melissa. Welcome. Thank you. Good evening. It's on. Um, up. Button yep. Up. Our Education for Employment Planning Team was a compilation of administration, high school and middle school teachers and counselors with given input from elementary, um, at the elementary level and district coordinators. Every school in the state of Wisconsin, as Sandy stated, is required to have an Education for Employment Plan or e for e plan. Education for Employment is one of the 20 state standards. It was developed in 1985 in response to the growing concern for the number of students who failed to make a successful transition from school to work. It is a PK through 12 standard with expectations at each grade level and within all disciplines, not just career technical education and guidance. Many activities are already taking place within our classrooms in the district. However, coordinating these activities to assure every student has the same opportunities to learn employability skills embedded in those 21st century skills is what the plan is all about. The purpose of the plan is to ensure that all students, regardless of their career objective, are given the skills, attitudes, and knowledge needed for successful future employment. In addition, the plan is to ensure technology or technological literacy, promote good citizenship, promote cooperation among business and industry, labor, post-secondary and public schools, 
and establish a role for public schools in the economic development in Wisconsin, all of which are enveloped in our HSD 2025 strategic plan. The Department of Public Instruction stressed that the process for developing revi and revising the plan was just as important as the end product. The EFRI plan is a tool to develop relationships and partnerships engage stakeholders and the broader community in the discussion, develop leadership, foster a learning environment where students can be successful, and promote lifelong learning so students can grow, adapt, and change to meet the ever-changing needs of our workplace, our workforce, and our global economy. Therefore, it was important to develop modest, realistic goals that were developed in collaboration with multiple stakeholders, which brings meaning to the process and thus the end product. The planning process was authentic and it was not a standalone plan. It is aligned with other district initiatives, as Sandy had stated, including our HSE 2025, RTI response to intervention, the ASCA counseling model, and units by design. Our goals support meaningful coordination and collaboration and are incremental. All help our district continue to move forward. Keeping in mind that the process was just as important as the end product, the team reviewed the 2004 plan and the program guide for 2009. Each required section of the plan was analyzed by what we currently have in place in the district and what our end goals were. The, then using a backwards design process, our goals were created and our gaps were identified. Each coordinated section of the plan, including specific guidelines for what was to be included, Outcomes of our, from our analysis showed numerous connections to district initiatives, as stated before, and some of those, again, just to reiterate, were Project Lead the Way, um, our community partnership team within Project Lead the Way, our increased articulation agreements with post-secondary institutions in our career tech ed programs, our ASCA counseling model, specifically at the eighth and 10th grade levels, our high school future research study team, district curriculum facilitators work with a five-year plan, identifying the, the uh, graduate learner outcomes, RTI, and many more. Our overall goals reflect these initiatives. The complete plan includes a breakdown of each of these goals. Our goals that we identified as a team were to have resources in place to offer further post-secondary educational opportunities during high school, that all schools will connect career clusters and pathways with curriculum and courses, and that all students will graduate with an individualized learning plan. Continuing with our goals, that we would have community involvement as a part of our E4E plan, that we will collaborate with other district initiatives to decrease the achievement gaps in each subgroup, and we will plan to expand staff development opportunities to implement the E4E goals. Our next steps are to have board approval. From there, move to the state superintendent for approval and to the Northwest Regional Tech Prep Council for approval. Then as a committee, we plan to work on a plan to roll out the E4E um, to all, all of the district. Thank you for your time. Are there any questions? Do we have any questions, board members? I don't have a question. I just I do have a comment. So nicely done, um, boiling you. down a very long report into a very <laughs> short um, <laughs> overview. Um, and I do think it. You know, um, you've said it a couple of times, but I think it bears repeating that um, what's really nice about this is the overlaps that we see between this particular plan, which is um, required by the state of Wisconsin, and our HSD 2025, and all of the other things that are going on in the district. So um, it is really validating to know that the some of the other work streams that we have going on um, are culminating in, in some things that the state is um, catching up to us on. And I also wanted to make a comment in that I we heard you talk about this in the Learning and Program Development Committee and um, was just really very excited about exactly what Barb says, how it um, pulls together um, all of the various strains of um, goals and priorities that the district has established and really um, demonstrates succinctly how all of those pieces uh, come together to create a unified whole um, 
that, that we're providing in terms of an overall education. And um, just the, the plan that you have for connecting these students with um, people who will um, be able to motivate them and encourage them and um, give them um, new windows to see opportunities they might not otherwise see. I'm, I'm very excited about the work that you're doing and I just want to thank you and the whole committee of people who worked on this. It was really a, a very um, diligent piece of work and it's very thought provoking in terms of the opportunities that it'll provide our students. Thank you. All right, thanks again for coming. Um, do have a question regarding, is this information going to be on the web? Because I, I found it very informative and I'm just thinking there's a, probably a lot of parents out there that would. I would say yes. Trace usually takes our PowerPoints okay. and puts them right on the next day. Okay, mm -hmm. good. Thanks, Melissa. Thank you. Mr. President, I have a question too. Is this information shared um, by the state with other schools? I mean, can we see what other schools submit or what other plans are like? And yeah, sorry. Yes, actually, each of the plans are reviewed by the Tech Prep Council, and from there they are visible to all other districts. But I'm not exactly certain as to where that site is. Okay. Thank you. Okay, we'll move on to consent items, uh, approval of the minutes. Mr. President, do we need we need an approval on this from the board? Oh, I'm sorry. Let me back up. Uh, education for employment plan. Entertain a motion for approval. Move so, to. Go ahead. Move to approve. Motion by Cindy. Is second. Second by Barb. Any discussion? If not, all those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed. <coughs> motions approved. Now we'll move on to the consent items, um, minutes, personnel. Somebody could uh, uh, provide the expenditures. Uh, Mr. President, I move to uh, approve the November 10th regular board meeting minutes, the October 31st session minutes, uh, personnel and expenditures, um, that the Director of Financial Services be authorized to pay bills in the amount of $1,040,616.85. Okay, we have a motion by Cindy. Do we have a second? Second. Second by Mark. Any discussion? If not, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Uh, Aye. Those opposed, motions approved. Well, uh, do we have some YMCA? Yes. Yes. We do. Mr. Okay. President, just in the interest of reminding our community about what it is that we're paying the YMCA for, before I actually make a motion to approve the expenditures, I'd just like to um, remind people that this, this month's expenditures are paying for a fifth grade trip, um, several fifth grade trips, uh, several fifth grade camps, um, four, four fifth grade camps and two fifth grade trips um, to the Y. And I think that's really um, incredible that our fifth graders are, are being able to use this facility and that we are being able to incorporate this environmental uh, curriculum with, with our own education and um, to partner with the Y in this way. I think it's very significant um, improvement, continuous improvement to, this, to the education our students are receiving. And okay. so with that, I move to that the Director of Financial Services be authorized to pay bills in the amount of? We're going to have Tom Holland. Excuse me, Cindy. Okay. Tom's going to step out while we Bye, Tom. take action on that item. $26,438.50 to the Y camp. Okay, we have a motion by Cindy. Second. Second by Lynn. Any discussion? If not, all those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, motion's approved. And Tom, you can come back in. We'll move on to uh, committee reports. Would it be okay if we just get a black screen and hold it in front of him from now on? <laughs> <laughs> okay, learning, learning and program development, Barb. Okay, Mr. President, the Learning and Program Development Committee met on November 19th. Um, we talked about a few things. Um, one of the things that um, uh, we heard about, Melissa Hansen joined us and uh, walked us through the, the presentation that you just saw on education for employment. Uh, we also were joined by two of the high school counselors who um, spent some time updating us on the FYI course. If you're not familiar with that, uh, that is the freshman year initiative that was started several years ago. Um, uh, to begin to talk about career stuff but really help the freshmen transition from the middle high to high school experience and get them to start thinking about beyond high school. Um, uh, Sandy Kovach talked about Project Lead the Way courses in Mandarin Chinese. Um, we spent some time talking about the, uh, the work that the administrative team will do to um, 
talk about course shifts, resource uh, reallocations as we bring on new courses. Um, and then we had a brief discussion about the SMART goal presentations that we have had the last couple of years. Okay, thanks, Barb. Any comments, questions for Barb? If, if not, thanks again. We'll move on to Facilities and Grounds Committee. Tom? Thank you. The Facilities and Grounds Committee met uh, on December 2nd. All the members were present. We had three agenda items, and then we went into closed session. The first item that we, we spoke about uh, was a report uh, from Jim Stasekel regarding the uh, T-ball field being developed at the North Hudson site by the Hudson Boosters. Field is located uh, behind the tennis courts. Uh, the field is down and prepared. There's been dormant seating. Uh, the arrangement with the boosters is that uh, the school would maintain the field uh, with the exception of the summer months in which the boosters would then take it on. So. Uh, we're excited to have that partnership and continue to work with the boosters in our community. Uh, the, the next agenda item that we had was, uh, was an update on our energy savings. Happy to report that uh, uh, we've had a realize a total savings to, to, well, from October 8th, uh, excuse me, October 08 to September 09 of $91,864. And just as a reminder to the board, uh, this is an agreement with CESA 10, who uh, have been our consultants on this project. Uh, we receive, as a district, 52% of that savings. The rest of that goes to CESA 10. Um, it's, uh, I think, important to note, I thought it was important to note, that um, much of the savings, uh, both in electrical and gas usage and things like that, have been done based on behavior <laughs> modifications, primarily, not necessarily system changes. And so um, I want to say thanks <laughs> to our, our staff who have really embraced, I think, this, uh, this, this concept and this effort, so and this initiative. So thanks to all of them. Uh, this happens to include all the schools in our district, with the exception of uh, River Crest Elementary School, which is, um, as we all know, a gold lead certified school. So we are already kind of built that all in place, I guess, uh, when, we, when, we first, when we opened the building. The last uh, regular agenda item was regarding the middle school uh, process for decision making. Um, we, you know, we are faced again with capacity issues at the middle school, and we looked at uh, the current enrollments based on capacity levels, and we're running nearly 100 students more than uh, we're really supposedly capable for. Um, we discussed, and I think the, uh, the administration was looking for some direction from our committee regarding how we move forward in the process in making decisions about short and long-term solutions. Uh, the, the three options that uh, were presented and discussed were uh, including changing internal um, uh, spaces. In other words, uh, much of what's been done and being done now is uh, student, uh, teachers are on carts, they're using common areas, they're doing creative things with the space that they've got. Um, uh, that certainly is, a, uh, is an option that uh, is important to be used, but we also understand that there's only so much you can do with that, and we have to come up with a permanent solution um, and a long-term solution uh, soon, <laughs> I'd say. Um, the, next, uh, the next option that we discussed was adding, uh, was, was uh, I'm sorry, changing the program uh, in other words, uh, adjusting the program such that uh, we could accommodate, uh, in some ways, uh, more, uh, you know, uh, more of the capacity issues. However, this really was quickly kind of, I think, discounted by our group uh, in our committee because uh, we have a real valuable uh, program with the middle school right now with the POD uh, program. We, th we see a high quality and a high value in that program, and we're really not, we're really suggesting we not go that direction. Um, the third option was to uh, add space, you know, whether that be uh, temporary, temporary slash permanent, you know, space, uh, you know, we rented facilities, or we did some things, that type of thing, uh, until we get to a full, uh, a long-term solution. So the direction, really, that, that we gave to the administration was 
within the bounds and, and uh, within the opportunities that we still have, let's, uh, let's continue to uh, look at changing in internal <coughs> spaces. Uh, but let's start working towards a long-term solution as quickly as we can uh, along the areas of, of adding space, however that may look or what, what that may look like. So um, then we went into a closed session regarding uh, the purpose for deliberating about a sale and, and or purchase of public properties. Uh, do any of the other committee members have anything to add to that? Or Mary, did I say miss anything? Great job. Thank you, good. Tom, Tom, can I ask a question regarding, and you, might, you may not know the answer to this, but at one point in time there was some stimulus mm -hmm. funds available for yep. um, dealing with school space issues. Is there, there is, and, and Tim can probably fill us in uh, largely on that, but we, we are waiting for some bureaucratic red tape. <laughs> is that right? Wow. And, and yeah. we're waiting for it or we're, we're, we're at the think, camera. I, I think we're in it. So. There there is a uh, there is a there's a second round of uh, what's called qualified school construction bonds and that that is the uh, portion of stimulus program that we would qualify for uh, really for a smaller project. Uh, a lot of districts use these. If they have a referendum on the table already, they're able to take advantage in a, in a larger quantity. But um, it's a competitive process, competitive application process. We uh, haven't been notified uh, when that process starts again for the second round, uh, but uh, we anticipate that they'll be letting us know soon. So um, again, to, to have a plan ready to go for that, if that's where we go with it. Well, we do believe that it's got some opportunity potentially in the next year, right, in 2010. Yes. Okay. Great. Any questions for Tom? <clears throat> Good report, Tom. Thanks. Thank you. Um, <laughs> yeah. We'll move on to Personnel and Negotiations <clears throat> Committee. Mark? Thanks, Dan. Uh, the Personnel Committee met uh, last week. We had um, uh, only a close uh, session on our agenda. And uh, specifically, I guess, two issues. Uh, first, we discussed uh, employee issues related to dismissal, discipline, employment, and performance evaluation. And then we had uh, further discussions to prepare for negotiations with our uh, two remaining uh, union groups. Uh, those would be representing teachers, educational assistants, health assistants, media assistants, and nutritional service employees. Any questions for Mark? Okay, thank you, Mark. Mm -hmm. um, Mary, back to you regarding our our guest from China. Yes, we, we were hoping to have an interpreter uh, be here. So, Mr. Zhang, our uh, guest, our Chinese administrator, who is visiting with us, could speak to you. Um, and unfortunately, the weather has made that not possible. Uh, Mr. Zhao is a Chinese administrator who I am partnered with through the Wisconsin Heilongjiang uh, administrative shadowing project that's in the state of Wisconsin. This project aligns certainly with HSD 2025, our vision and plan, and this year's district goal uh, of global literacy. The purpose, or one of the primary purposes of the shadowing project is for both schools our being number six and Hudson High School to learn from each other uh, in order to improve education for all of our students and global literacy. Uh, really the purpose is to engage staff and students in uh, global literacy and uh, being um, neighbors with our friends and uh, around the world. So uh, Mr. Zhao, welcome. Ni hao. Ni hao. <laughs> Ni hao. And um, would you introduce yourself, please? My name is Xiao Guangsheng. I come from Heilongjiang, Harbin, number six high school. Nice to meet you. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. Thank you. It's so good to have Mr. Zhao with us. Um, certainly, he's been trying to teach me some Mandarin. Um, I'm hosting, <laughs> he is a guest in my home, and I have been able to uh, pick up 
about four words, or at least part of four words. Um, he's picking up more English than I'm picking up Mandarin, I can assure you of that. Uh, Mr. Zhao has been with us uh, since Saturday, and with the help of a number of Mandarin translators, um, we have gotten to know him, uh, really appreciate him as a fellow administrator. He's a vice principal in a high school in Harbin, uh, it is one of a number of high schools, but a high-performing high school where most of their students go on to the university. And uh, it has grades 10, 11, and 12. Um, during this time period, I know those of us who have had an opportunity to talk with him have learned more about Chinese education, and uh, we plan to, to learn a lot more along the way. He's been in the high school for two days, thanks to Mr. Lucas and his staff. And um, in fact, uh, he was in the Mandarin Chinese classroom today with Mr. Lucas and myself and, and Meg Heaton. And we were playing a game with the students and we all, I don't know if you got into Chinese, anything in Mandarin, Meg, but the rest of us did. <laughs> and um, so he's not only in that class, but in many other classes throughout the school so that he can learn more about education here. Uh, he's also been experiencing um, cultural uh, and area experiences. He's had a tour of the Twin Cities. Um, one of his highlights, um, certainly cultural for us, is a, a, a our athletics, and so he was able to go to the NBA, the Timberwolves game. Uh, he was a guest of my husband and I at that game. Um, he's been, had the opportunity to eat at the high school and enjoyed that, <laughs> no. hamburger and pizza, I remember. And uh, he's had dinner in uh, a couple homes in our district. Um, certainly people have been able to enjoy him, and we've had um, other people join us for dinner to be able to uh, get to know him and learn about um, China as well. And he's eaten in local uh, restaurants, and I think there was um, uh, one this evening as well. Uh, he's, he will be touring all of our facilities before he leaves on Thursday afternoon. He's been to a local farm and also to the Carpenter Nature Center. And uh, he plans to attend uh, Rotary, except we're, we need to explain that a little bit better, <laughs> what Rotary is, um, both of our Rotary clubs um, on Wednesday and Thursday. You know, our goals with this project is to establish an ongoing partnership so that we can um, create new opportunities for our students to be engaged with um, their neighbors on the other side of the world. So this is a really important um, step for us and one that we want to continue. I, as you know, I will be traveling to Beijing um, to learn from the Ministry of Education there and then on to Harbin and to number six high school. And I will stay with Mr. Zhang and his family and um, in April. And I want to thank Tracy as well, uh, Tracy Havishaline, for really coordinating uh, Mr. Zhang's schedule, uh, working with all of our translators, um, searching and seeking out. I should note that our translators have come, they've been Hudson High School graduates and previous students. Um, they have come from the University of Wisconsin River Falls. They've come from the University of Minnesota. They ha are also community and area residents. So we've been very fortunate to tap into some of those individuals in our community with um, that kind of um, skill to be able to speak Mandarin, and that's been great too. So um, Tracy has been hosting many of the activities as well and making sure, along with myself, that Mr. Zhang uh, gets to the next activity. And he was hoping to attend a basketball game tonight, um, but unfortunately that was canceled. Tracy, is there anything else you'd like to add? Did we cover most of it? it covers it. Yes. Great. Uh, ni hao. Ni hao. That means uh, hello. And um, thank you. Xie xie. Xie xie. He says it better than I do. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome again. And, and I know I had a brief uh, conversation with Mr. Zhang about the snow that we're getting, and apparently where he comes from, they get lots of snow as well, yeah. so this, <laughs> is, this is nothing new. But again, welcome to, 
to Hudson and Wisconsin. So. Harbin is known as the Ice City and have an absolutely wonderful ice and snow festival in February that um, I hope you have the opportunity to go online and see those pictures. When we think of the, um, the ice carnival in St. Paul, Harbin is way beyond that one. Uh, it's amazing. Okay. Thanks, Mary. Um, we'll move on to, I don't think we have any other citizens. Uh, we do have a citizen's request to speak. Is it Pat, Pat German? If you'd like to come forward and state your name and address, please. My name is Patricia German, and I live in Hudson. At I can hear it. You can't hear it. Okay, <laughs> sorry. Um, I live at 473 Green Mill Lane. Hudson. Um, I guess I came to the last meeting and was intrigued and it was interesting. And I was just wondering, um, I mean, the talk of, of we're busting our seams already or whatever. The, uh, I've had, um, let's see, eight children come through Hudson School and have, and there's two left in high school. And they've had very good education. And thank you. And I was just wondering, and I know many families have come out here, <laughs> so that's why we have the schools. I was wondering if I could get the opportunity to know um, the exact, I don't know how much, the, this building, this, which was, we've been in here one year, right? This is our second year in Willow Creek? Okay, and um, I was wondering what the cost is per square foot each. If anybody has that, probably don't have it right now. Mary? Well, I just want to um, thank Pat for uh, delivering a letter to us to let us know what um, she was interested, what information you were interested in. And as a result of that, we have, been, we have that along so that we can uh, let you know. And I know Tim Erickson, our financial services director, is going to share that for you okay. in a few minutes. Okay, I can write it down. <laughs> I'll go back soon. Okay. Well, the other thing was, are we to capacity in this school already, or do we have some room left? I guess that's what I would, uh, how many students w can be taught in here before we're, we're busted out, and how many we have right now would be the information. So, thank Okay, you. thank you. Tim, did you? That last question as well. Sure, uh, I'll start with the last question. We the uh, building capacity. Uh, the Rivercrest was built for capacity of 588 students plus uh, early childhood. Uh, right now, and I may need help from some of my colleagues on what our number is currently, uh, if we have it. But we don't. Maybe we don't have that uh, exactly where we are. Uh, we do have capacity. We do have additional capacity here uh, currently, though. Uh, the uh, cost per square foot. Uh, the building was built for about $166 per square foot, and that includes really everything except the uh, the land that the building is sitting on. Um, when we look at that $166 per square foot number. Um, it was built $57 a square foot less, or 29% below uh, the average cost for public elementary schools built in Illinois, Minnesota, and Wisconsin. Uh, and that's according to a 2008 report in School Planning and Management magazine. So uh, when we equate that $57 a square foot, the building's a little over 93,000 square feet. Um, and I, you know, this is a little bit of a plug for us, but uh, we saved, if you equate that, 93000 at $57 a square foot, we saved, we built it for $5.3 million under what an average school would be. Uh, not only that, but we also are LEED certified. Um, uh, we're, we're just the second public elementary school in the nation to receive LEED gold uh, under the schools category, and uh, we're, we're second 
uh, of only two public school buildings in the state to receive the LEED Gold designation. So again, uh, a, a very positive thing because uh, we're able to operate this school uh, for less cost than a traditional school. We use less water uh, in terms of percentage, uh, uh, less water, less electric, HVAC systems are more efficient. Um, so, uh, and all that for a cost of $57 a square foot less. Tim, question? Um, we have frequently heard the cost per square foot to build, and we know that we built this to be a highly energy efficient building and, and with a lot of savings built into the, into the construction of it. Um, can you, and this is probably an unfair question because it's one of those like numbers people don't just pull out of their hat um, without you know looking it up and, and whatever, and I don't expect you to have it uh, memorized, but can you give us some um, kind of concrete comparison of the um, per square foot operating cost of this building compared to our other elementary schools, either now or maybe in the future? Whoops. Um, we have to we've got to get a baseline established and because this is only the second year we don't we don't really have a baseline established at this point uh, but i would have, would imagine going forward uh, we'll be able to develop that baseline and be able to give that information i i just would like to reiterate or point out the um, comparisons pat that tim talked about um, with those schools in uh, the average cost of construction in Illinois, uh, Wisconsin, and Minnesota. That was for conventional construction along with green, uh, but mostly that's conventional construction. So essentially this school was built to be a uh, green school, certainly environmentally friendly with lower operating costs, and still um, we are much lower than the average cost of construction of new, el new elementary schools throughout those three states. If you have additional questions, Patricia, feel free to call either Mary or Tim. Um, we have another request to speak, Amy. Hello, I'm Welcome. Amy Hamburg, 1126 Bald Eagle Road North, obviously uh, also the principal at um, EP Iraq. But I wanted to take um, just a moment to thank um, the local community for some of the gifts they've given generously during December. And it's to name, name them might be um, taking a risk, but um, Citizen State Bank, um, Employees um, did a hat drive and clothing drive for coats. Um, and some of these contributions have come directly to Rock, but they've also gone to other buildings. Um, Family Fresh, as many of you know, if you shop there, they've been collecting books. Um, Hudson Walmart also donated over 100 books to EP Rock. Um, and lastly, Hudson Target um, just this week um, donated a Christmas tree to one of our families. And, and it is just the tip of the iceberg, but I wanted to recognize those local businesses. So thank you very much. Thanks, Amy. And, uh, and again, from, from the board, we, we welcome those contributions from the local businesses. And I, and I know there's many more besides that that are contributing not only to the schools, but to the community as a whole. Um, <clears throat> unless there's any other Request to speak. We'll move on to um, closed session. I'll entertain a motion to go into closed session. So Mr. Moved. Oh, sorry. I move to <laughs> go into closed session pursuant to Wisconsin statutes 19.85 parent 1 parent E for the purpose of deliberating to prepare for negotiations with union groups, groups representing teachers, educational assistants, media assistants, health assistants, and the nutritional services employees and for the purpose of deliberating about the sale and or purchase of public properties. Okay, we have a motion by Lynn. I'll second that. Second by Mark. Uh, we'll have a roll call. Robson, aye. Kaiser shot, aye. Holland, aye. Chernoy, aye. Crimmins, aye. Van Loon, and aye. Okay, thank you.